Do you want me to speak now? I'm sorry. Yeah. Of course, we are deeply shocked and deeply regretful about the results of uh, last night's broadcast. I simply don't know. I can't imagine. I mean, I, uh, you must realize that I, when I left the broadcast last night, I went into... In October 1938, a 24-year-old actor-manager, Orson Welles, caused panic across the United States with a radio version of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. Were you aware of terror at the time you were giving this role? Were you aware that terror was going on throughout oh, the nation? Oh, no, of course not. You know, we did Dracula, and uh, it seemed to me during Dracula I had high hopes that people would uh, react as they do in a movie uh, of that kind, and uh, uh, I don't know that they did particularly, and uh, so I've given up. One doesn't believe in the radio audience much. You don't know that they're, that whether they're listening or not. You have no idea how many people are listening or what they're thinking. I had every hope that, uh, that the people would be excited as they would be at a melodrama. One person who got excited was the new president of RKO, George Schaefer, who'd taken over in December 1938. The first thing he did was to revive the system of independent production units introduced by David O. Selznick. The Mercury Theater, Orson Welles' company, seemed an eligible candidate, the only drawback being they'd never made a film. But if the young Welles could cause such a stir with a radio broadcast, what couldn't he do once he learned to make a movie? <laughs> In 1942, Orson Welles' career as a Hollywood producer, director, writer came to a spectacular end with the South American fiasco of It's All True. He'd been at our... After all the effort that went into Ambersons, the irony is that the film was changed and savagely cut by the studio in Welles' absence. This sad postscript is now a familiar part of cinema history. It was a blow from which Wells himself says he never recovered. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The reason for his absence was America's sudden involvement in the Second World War, with the bombing of Pearl Harbor in December 1941. The magnificent Ambersons was still in production when Wells was recruited for the government by Nelson Rockefeller and John Hay Whitney and sent on a bizarre goodwill mission to South America. Its purpose was to counteract the spread of fascism. Wells received an official cable two weeks later on December 20th. This is it, the cable dated December 20th, 1941. To Orson Wells from John Hay Whitney. Dear Orson, we understand you are willing and may be able to undertake trip to Brazil where you would produce motion pictures in cooperation with Brazilian government. Personally believe you would make great contribution to Hemisphere solidarity with this project. Regards. What happened next was to prove one of the most disastrous episodes in Wells' career. It began with characteristic enthusiasm and flamboyance. When I came back from an IATSE meeting in New York, I found Wells very busy getting together a plane load of people, not just two or three people, but a plane load of people to take down to South America. Well, and nothing I could say could make any difference because Rockefeller had approved it and Schaefer had approved it. Among the group detailed for South American duty and entrusted with a large part of RKO's stock of cameras, was Joseph Byrock. We left on Tuesday night. I called my wife at 4 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. says, I'm leaving at 6 o'clock to go to South America. She says, 6 o'clock, you don't have anything packed. So I came home and packed and went to the studio and left. So that's how quick everything was. Also assembled for the group, Secretary Betty Amster. 
But we flew down on a big Pan American Clipper ship. We made a slow trip down and uh, saw a lot of South America on the way and got the crew was aboard the ship. Orson was not, and we got to know each other pretty well, and they all seemed like wonderful, wonderful people to me and made a lot of fun of me. I was the only woman on the trip. In Rio, I learned that I had to earn my keep, and I typed a daily record of everything that happened. And uh, besides that, um, we danced at the Urca, the great casino, almost every night. And uh, I danced with most members of the crew and danced and danced and danced. <laughs> the expedition had set out to Brazil with only the sketchiest idea of what they were to shoot. There was talk of a multi-part picture reflecting South American life, mixing drama and documentary elements. The initial idea was to shoot a segment at the Rio Carnival, though Wells had never been to a carnival and confessed something of a distaste for them. However, it was known to be a spectacular affair, and it was just about to happen. The Orson arrived just on the eve of carnival, and they were set up to shoot carnival with whatever was at hand. So for a week or two, the crew was very, very busy. four hours a day for four days. The carnival never stops. So what happened, he got us all together the next day, he says, okay, he says, uh, take a week off and at the end of a week come back and find out how the hell we can make a picture out of this. I spent a great deal of time in the American Library uh, researching everything that could possibly serve as background for the picture that was being shot in Brazil about carnival and uh, one simply fed it into a giant hopper. The writers who were, had been engaged, the Brazilian writers, were doing the same thing. Wells was lionized in Brazil and took to his role as envoy with enthusiasm. Not so much as a propagandist for America, but as an advocate for the people and culture of Brazil. And he began to make regular broadcasts back to America for CBS radio. The golden beaches on the Copacabana, the casinos, the smart women and the pretty girls. But there's another side of Rio. You hear it? Not a seamy side, not at all. There isn't a jazz myth up north who could ever express it. Everybody dances to it. It's called samba. Wells threw himself into the Rio nightlife with equal energy. He was particularly taken with Rio's grandest casino and night spot, the Orca whose floor show he praised in a local paper. One of the chief attractions at the Urca was the 26-year-old singer and dancer, Grande Otelo. Wells took to him immediately and decided later to give him a role in the movie. E depois do show, terminou o show, eu fui me sentar na mesa do Arson Wells. Foi uma das poucas vezes que eu fui ao Grio Home da Urca. E perguntei a ele se ele tinha gostado do meu trabalho. Ele simplesmente me disse, you are the Você é super ator. Aí minha cara caiu, fiquei envergonhado e nunca mais quis saber quem é que estava no público, nem coisa nenhuma, e tratei de fazer o meu trabalho sempre como todos os dias. During the daytime, Wells was occupied with trying to turn what was essentially documentary footage into an Orson Welles film. His plan was to restage elements of the carnival with particular performers, lit and composed in his own distinctive way. None of this footage has survived. By all accounts, progress was slow and difficult, and the many counter-attractions of real life hard to resist. Realmente, o Austin Ellis gostava de beber. Não se pode negar. Mas acontece que todas as vezes que nós chegássemos no estúdio, eu e o Erivelto, que trabalhávamos com ele, se chegávamos às 7 e 15 o Austin Ellis já estava no estúdio apontando o relógio. Porque ele já estava lá para trabalhar. Então, o Austin Ellis aqui sempre foi um trabalhador, sempre trabalhou... Um, 
24 horas por dia sem parar. Mr. Orson Welles, Copacabana Palace, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Cable where I could phone you Saturday around noon New York time. Regards, George Schaefer. Await your call, 272-416. Fondest regards. Dear Orson, I've been trying for past two days to reach you on phone, but unable to get through connection. Stop. There were several times the studio got a little bit peeved with Orson Welles. And uh, to make it tougher on him, they wouldn't send us Technicolor film. Didn't matter to us. We were getting paid. We were sitting down there having a wonderful time. He uh, acted very strangely with Brazil. Besides, he had a relationship with a girl down there, and he would disappear for maybe two or three hours when they were supposed to be shooting. I guess some of that was brought out in the Lynn Shores reports. Lynn Shores, Wells production manager, had begun to panic. He started to write a succession of letters detailing his many agonies to the head of production back at RKO. Dear Walter, I am enclosing working report for the week April 7th to 13th inclusive, our 12th week here. Last Friday, Wells ordered day and night shots in some very dirty and disreputable nigger neighborhoods throughout the city. I was advised by the assistant director that this would cause trouble if we were caught, as the government is very touchy on the colored question down here and even prohibits sightseeing cars from taking tourists into these sections. As Wells could not be located, this is the day he ducked Schaefer's telephone call all day, I finally sent the company out. We had more on those people that were with us than the studio had on us. We could blackmail anybody that was down there with us. You know, just like I say with Austin Wells, and uh, we could black. There's too many people. We're staying with too many people. And too many people down there. At that particular time, 70% of the people in Brazil were black or had black blood. So there was nothing. To... We had one. One man, I hate to say what the property was in, but he was one of the guys that said, I'm going to be at the end of six weeks, I'm going back to Hollywood. The end of six weeks, he, has, he had nothing. He was living with the red-headed black girl. He didn't want to come home. Matter of fact, he came back here at the end of seven or eight months and went right back again. It was a bone of contention between RKO and Orson what he was shooting, what the carnival consisted of. The carnival for him was essentially a black story. The story of Brazilian music started in black communities, in the slums, just as jazz started in the black communities and made its way into the white strata. So they were very unhappy with what he shot. E recebia sempre reportagens, recebia sempre notícias de que Orson Welles filmou o dia inteiro só negros. E o Itamaraty achou que realmente o Itamaraty é o nosso departamento de relações exteriores. Realmente é, o, in, o indicado, o enviado da RCO estava com a razão, que estavam filmando muitos negros. Então a sociedade brasileira é, se movimentou no sentido de boicotar o filme do Orson Welles através da RCO. E como de fato boicotou e deixou o Orson Welles sem dinheiro. Aqui está o Copacabana Palace, onde muita madrugada eu deixei o Orson Welles depois de passar uma noitada tomando uma cerveja. Na sua casa? Na minha casa. E eu que falar disso aqui assisti o Orson Welles. Explicar o embaixador do México, o Alfonso Reis, que perguntou a ele por que, como ele tinha conseguido fazer aquela cena tão violenta de destruir o quarto da mulher, ele disse: Foi assim, e destruiu o quarto do hotel. O estúdio personal had lost confidence in Wells. We were not getting any very constructive information from Brazil or in any part of South America. And I, for one, was very unhappy about the whole situation. Well, it was just as the picture was really, truly getting underway. 
And uh, there were many arguments about a big Las Vegas nightclub review of Pan America. All of the countries came out and sang a little bit of their song. And it was a beautiful thing with lots of beautiful girls and the flags of each nation coming out in a great Pan America number. And they felt the budget was too high on that. And uh, finally, uh, RKO through Schaefer said, well, maybe we'd better stop this. It's too far away and control it. Maybe we'd better send somebody down, finish this picture off, and get those boys home. The announcement by RKO and all the Rio papers that they would henceforth not be responsible for any debts of Mr. Orson Welles signaled the end of the South American adventure. Orson Welles, when he went out, he offered me a cigarette of plata com uma homenagem muito bonita, cigarreira essa aqui numa das minhas bebedeiras, eu acabei perdendo dentro de um táxi. E um chofer achou e me disse, olha, achei tua cigarreira com inscrição e tal, eu não vou te dar não, porque eu vou guardar de lembrança. E por aí ficou. Ficou a minha saudade do Orson Welles, ficou a minha vontade de ver o filme que eu tinha feito, o primeiro filme para o estrangeiro, e mais nada. Essa é a outra oportunidade que eu tenho de fazer um filme para a Europa de fala inglesa. E eu agradeço muito essa oportunidade que estão me dando. O que é isso, saudade? Saudade, meu caro diretor, não tem tradução. Se você quiser traduzir, você dirá que é uma certa melancolia de não termos mais aquele amigo certo, das horas certas. E então ficou saudade. Wells was sacked by RKO and his long-suffering patron, George Schaefer, replaced as head of the studio. The South American footage, much of it still unprinted, languished in various vaults for 45 years, a perennial embarrassment to successive regimes at the studio. The film is now dangerously decayed because of the nitrate base of the film stock, and it seems improbable that any more scenes can be salvaged. As an ironic revenge on Wells, his Pan American pageant idea reappeared in the 1945 RKO film Pan Americana, now safely contained in the studio and sanitized for popular consumption. The new regime at RKO proclaimed a new motto, showmanship instead of genius. It was, of course, a perfectly overt reference to Orson Welles. The new boss at RKO was Charles Kerner, who had run their chain of movie theaters but never produced a picture. Even so, his regime was to be one of the company's most successful financially. And under very special circumstances, there was a war on. In part five of Tales from Hollywood, we look at the upsurge of patriotism in the early 40s and the somber mood that set in once the war was over. You're no good for anyone but me. You're no good and neither am I. That's why we deserve each other. After innovating with the film noir, RKO hits trouble when two of its key employees fall victim to the communist witch hunts of 1947. Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? It's unfortunate and tragic that I have to teach this committee the that's basic principles the of Americanism. Question. That's not the question. The question is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? 
Charlie Rose is coming up at 11. I'll be back with the Bulldog Edition and a look at tomorrow's headlines in just a moment. But first, here's a look at this